For Krima Media's policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, South African marathon and ultra marathon athlete Bruce Fordyce discusses his book titled Winged Messenger, Running Your First Comrades Marathon. Your achievements as a distance runner are most remarkable. You won the Comrades Marathon nine times, you won the London to Brunton Marathon three years in a row, and you are the former world record holder over 50 miles and 100 kilometer. So what made you such a good runner and what was the secret to your success? I'll tell you what, um, the first thing is, is that you have to choose your parents very correctly, very carefully. And by that, I mean, you, it, it's genetic, okay? so. If you put good marathon runners together, you will find that most of them have the same kind of body type. We are small, we are light, we are skinny, we have very strong legs, a very good heart and lungs, and no brain cells because it's a really stupid thing to do, you know, to run 90 kilometer race. So, but then having done that, you obviously have to have the personality type to do the training and you have to have patience because um, building a, 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 a successful uh, marathon runner, and I'm going to use the word as if it was is constructing something, is almost like developing a fine wine. You cannot hurry the process. It takes many months, many years before you get to the point where you're now truly world class or international class. And the problem is so many of us see the stars doing well, but what you don't see is the years that came before that when they trained very hard and when they prepared themselves. And could you share with us how it feels crossing the finish line in first place? What are the emotions that you most remember? Well, yeah, it has to be, for the Comrades Marathon particularly, it has to be one of the most incredible moments. I would, I would sell my soul to do it again. Uh, but unfortunately, I sold my soul a long time ago. Um, but uh, it's joy. It's overwhelming. A lot of Comrades runners will cry uh winners will cry and um, and then if if you've had a very tough race it can also be relief because you're completely relieved that you've done it and that you and that you you've won um you know because you might have only known that you were going to win right at the end and but i can tell you that the last lap of the comrades marathon is one of the most emotional things ever because as you come as you come into the stadium there's an official or a little boy or a little girl who stands there with a baton. They hold this baton and they hand it to you as you come in. And that baton rolled up inside has got a message from the mayor of the city you ran from, so from the mayor of Durban to the mayor of Peter Maritzburg, and it gets read out after the winner has crossed the line. And to carry that baton for the last lap of comrades is extremely emotional. It's um, all the pain and the exhaustion sort of drains out of you and this baton is like a lightsaber. It's like Excalibur. There's, I, there's not a single Comrades winner that I can think of who hasn't raised it up in the air. You raise it up in the air and you pump it. You can say, guys, I've got the baton. I'm going to win. Yeah, so it's a very, very emotional thing. And lucky, I was very lucky to experience it nine times. So I was very fortunate. Famously, you wore a black armband in 1981 when you first wore the Comrades Marathon as a protest against apartheid and the apartheid government's Republic Day celebrations. Could you tell us more about this? Yes, yeah, so, you know, you have to go back, I think, before you were even born. <laughs> to 1981 was 20 years of apartheid rule. So there was a celebration for 20 years of the nationalist government uh, governing South Africa being the ruling party and i'm using the word ruling party particularly because actually monarchs kings and despots rule governments govern and we need to remember that but um definitely the apartheid era nationalist party they ruled us and so they decided we were going to celebrate this 20 years of apartheid and those of us who were opposed to it um there was a slogan at the time going around saying no cause to celebrate there's nothing to celebrate people were in detention people were dying uh, we were the the polecats of the world. We couldn't play sport internationally anymore. It was just a hideous time. And, and sadly, comrades became part of that celebration. I don't know how it happened, but they became part of the, the celebration of 20 years of apartheid, along with tank parades and other sporting events. So those of us who were not happy with the situation, but still wanted to run, showed our displeasure and our disagreement with it by wearing black armbands. And so, that was where the armband came from. I was not the only one who wore an armband on the day. Lots of runners did. 
uh, but I was just the most prominent because I won. So, you know, in a sense, I made a, a big statement because I won. If I had just finished Comrades, well, I would have been lost in the masses, but I won the race. So that was quite a statement at the time. And you have received many accolades as a great South African, including an honorary doctorate from your alma mater, Wits University, yet you were born in Hong Kong. Tell us a little bit about your family history. Yes, yeah, so first of all, let me point out, I'm, I'm South African through and through. When there's a rugby match on, I, my blood is green. You know, and, and Bafana, I support Bafana, I support the protest. So I'm a South African through and through, but it just happened that my father was in the army in Hong Kong, in the Far East, when I was born there. And my sister was born in Singapore. So for us, that was actually wonderful. He was a soldier there. It was a wonderful place to grow up. And it's where very early on in my life, I learned to play with children of all different races and all different colors. My friends were Indians, Malays, Chinese. And then we returned to South Africa. I was completely mystified by apartheid because I couldn't understand, but why are you keeping us all apart? That's not how it works. It works best when we all get together and your friend is your friend, regardless of their skin color or who they are. So yeah, then we, we returned to South Africa and uh, I, 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 we had a short stay in, in, in the United Kingdom where I went to school there, which was very valuable for me. And yeah, then we came back to South Africa and I've been here ever since. And in more recent years, you have been the driving force behind shorter five kilometer park runs. Tell us more about your vision for park runs that have become popular throughout South Africa and around the world. The vision is that it, it's a wonderful, um, I could wax lyrical about park run all day long. It's five Ks, it's free on a Saturday morning. All you have to do is bring a barcode so you can get your result. And it should actually be called park run slash walk because more than half our people at Park Run walk. They can't run 5Ks. And it's, the one, and it's run in parks and beaches and farms and housing estates all over the country. And in fact, we're moving into Africa with Zimbabwe. We're in Namibia, I'd like to move up into Zimbabwe as well. And it's spreading very rapidly, but it's very welcoming and it's very non-threatening. So if you're not an athlete, it's the one place I think where you can find that you are welcome you, no one's going to laugh at you. You can be slow. You can never be last because we have a person called a tail walker who goes at the back and makes sure everybody's finished and they're all safe. And people get truly, truly addicted to parkrun. And I've discovered that it's actually, yes, the exercise is great and that you do a 5K run or a walk, but it's more about communities getting together. And the communities get together and they can't wait to see each other each Saturday morning and to parkrun together. We started with one park run that had 26 people in November 2011 at Delta Park in Johannesburg. And we are now about 225 park runs with a membership of 1.2 million. So we have 1.2 million park run members. Unfortunately, because of lockdown, we are not able to participate at this stage. But we have a feeling and a sense that we are very close. And you cannot believe how desperate the parkrunners are to parkrun again and to get together again. And I think we now know that in the open air, in, in, in the fresh air exercising um, with certain COVID restrictions, you have absolutely minuscule chance of catching uh, coronavirus. So we are impatient to get back and we think that that time is not too far away. Many novices find running an unpleasant experience. What advice do you have for running novices? Should they time themselves and expect to get faster every time they run? Tavi, my advice for a novice <laughs> is make it as much fun as you possibly can. And then you won't have a problem with coming back, you see. So let me explain what I mean. But let's say you weren't a runner and you wanted to start. I would say to you, please make your first run so easy. Make it ridiculously easy. So my first run of my life was June the 8th, 1976, and I ran for 10 minutes around the Wits University rugby field. And I had to stop twice and walk because I was so unfit. But by chance, I did exactly the right thing. Because I made it easy, I had no problem with coming out the next day and going again. And so I made it easy. I made my, I only increased my mileage very, very, very gradually, little by little until one day I was doing 15 minutes and then a month later, maybe doing half an hour. 
you know, like that. And so I made it very easy. So that was also very easy to come out and start again. I also dressed correctly for the occasion. So by that, what I mean is if I, I wore a, you know, I wore a t-shirt and some running shorts and some running shoes. I can spot a novice like that, a first time I can spot them, first of all, on a morning like this morning, which is a beautifully warm morning, they will have a full tracksuit on and a hoodie and they're listening to music and they are hating it and they're going as hard as they can and they're not going to come out tomorrow. So it's that you've got to make it as easy as possible and then it helps if you meet somebody, meet a companion. Because when you're meeting somebody to run or walk or, or, or exercise together, shared discipline is a lot easier than individual discipline and you're less likely to not, well, you're not going to want to let somebody down. So that happens. And then the final thing is you have to do it for three months. After three months, the exercise, and I'm not an evangelist for running, so it could be cycling, gym, whatever it might be, walking, but let's say it's running. After three months, it has become such a part of your day such a part of your routine that if you miss it that whole day you're aware something's not quite right and i love a day off by the way i love to take a day off but by the second or third day if i haven't run i start to feel i feel like greasy like there's itchy things on me why because i'm addicted to exercise and when you exercise your body releases a natural morphine called endorphins which make you feel good while you exercise and so in a sense Runners are addicts. We're addicted to the endorphins that we release when we exercise. And, but you've got to get to three months to get addicted. After that, you won't stop. And in what way does naming uh, different runs and route description help uh, new runners? In my book that I released, Wing Messenger, there it is. I got, bought a copy of um, I wrote about my early runs. I gave them names. Um, and that just meant it was very easy for me to uh, know exactly what route I was talking about and I kept a training diary so I wrote those down on there but I have a I have a running group who I run with uh, in fact I'm running with them tomorrow morning early tomorrow morning we call the Tyrone Harriers uh, there is no such running club we just call ourselves that because we leave from a street called Tyrone Avenue in Parkview and we have all sorts of different names for our for our runs we have a run called West Face East Face uh, how train that means we go past the how train station you see so already uh, i can tell you one one of them is called gupta corner why is it called gupta corner because we run past the gupta's house where they used to live so we we give them names and then everybody knows what that run is how hilly it's going to be how long it's going to be how tough it's going to be and lastly what advice can you give to new runners that want to give up because they perceive that they are not making any progress and are not getting fitter the advice i gave in the very beginning um, it takes a while to, to get fit, uh, and so you have to have patience. Like making a fine red wine that takes uh, many years of wine being made and then laying it down in a bottle to make it to help it mature, you have to do that. You've got to understand that fitness comes gradually and slowly, and if, actually if you try and rush the process, you end up hating it so much and you end up uh, getting injured. So really it's just have the patience, and, and then do not weigh yourself. Do not go and jump on the scales every day to see how much weight you've lost. Because guess what? Sometimes your weight's gone up. Why has it gone up? Because actually what's happening is that you're losing fat and you're gaining muscle. And muscle weighs more on the scales. So you actually get depressed because you say, I've been running for two weeks and my weight's gone up. What you really need to look at is what your belt on your, on your jeans is doing. Because that's going in because your muscle, your body is becoming more muscular, slimmer, fitter, stronger, but possibly even a tiny bit heavier for a while because the fat is being converted into muscle. That was Bruce Podais speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about winged messenger.